All right, welcome to our next video in the series. This is traversing multi-dimensional arrays. You should be familiar with what an array is. You should be familiar with how to traverse a one-dimensional array. And if you're in that spot, then you are ready for this subject. So we know uh, to declare a multi-dimensional array, it would look a little something like this. We would say, uh, for example, let's give one two dimensions. It's some numbers. It's a new two-dimensional array. And it's got um, you know three rows and four columns, let's say something like that. And we know that means that this is a grid of 12 elements, three rows, four columns. We can hold 12 different numbers in here. We're good to go. Well, what if we wanted to visit all of the elements of a two-dimensional array? What if we needed to traverse this array? And maybe we're looking for a value. Maybe we're trying to calculate the sum or average of all values in this array. How would we do it? You've probably guessed if a for loop was the tool for traversing a one-dimensional array, well, then a for loop is going to be the tool for traversing a multi-dimensional array. So what I'm going to do is just to kind of help um, fill things in, I'm going to go ahead and put it some numbers in this array. So let's put in, uh, we've got a 3 here at the location 0, 0. And we're going to put in... I don't know, how about like a 5 at location 1, 1. And then let's put something in the bottom corner. So the last row is going to be index 2. The last column is going to be index 3. And I'm going to put a 42 in there. The answer to life's most important question. Very good. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I want to visit all of the elements in the array. I can see that if I add up all those numbers up, I get the number 50. Great. Hurrah. But let's say... We're dealing with an array that for one reason or another, we don't know what the values are. Maybe they were populated by a uh, file. Maybe they were given by the user. There's a lot of reasons we might not be sure what values are there. I want to go ahead and sum up the values in an array. How would I do that? Well, to visit all the elements, we would have to say for int i equals 0, i less than, and this is the part that's going to look familiar. We're going to say nums.length. Nums.length length and this should look correct for how to visit a one-dimensional array but as we know I can't just ask for nums of zero and nums of one because in a two-dimensional array nums of zero is referring to a one-dimensional array nums of zero is a row it's the first row and so I don't want the whole row, I gotta be able to go number by number down that row. So a two-dimensional array is gonna use a two-dimensional, uh, a, a nested for loop. So it's gonna look a little something like this. For int, remember if we're nesting, i is in scope here, I can't use i as my index. I'm gonna say int j, the letter after i. j is zero. j less than, and you might think that the answer is nums.length. And if you pause and think about it for a second, you can see that there, oops, nums. <laughs> Little Lincoln Park cropping up right there. Um, you can see there's a reason why this isn't gonna work. And it goes back to what we talked about in the last video, which is that nums.length is, answers the question, uh, what's the number of rows? But if I want the number of columns, I'm gonna have to say nums of zero dot length. Nums of zero is that first row, and I'm going to say, okay, how many number of columns? So I actually right here have to say nums of zero. And I'm actually going to refi revise that even further here in a minute, but set that aside for a second. Let's talk about what's going to happen. What are the values of i and j when this thing runs? I'm going to go ahead and make a little variable table right here. And when this thing starts out, i holds the value 0, and j will take the value 0 after i gets the value 0. And what will happen is, for a brief moment, uh, for, for this first time through, uh, let's say I am trying to get the sum. Let me go ahead and prime my loop. And I'm going to say sum plus equals nums of i j. Whew, that is a line of code to unpack. Let's talk about this. Well, we enter the outer loop. I initializes to zero. 
we test is zero less than nums length. It is so we can go inside the I loop to the J loop and we initialize J to zero and we test is J less than nums of zero dot length. It is nums of zero dot length is four and we're currently at zero. So we're totally fine. So we enter our J loop and then we go asking for nums of I J. Now that might look really confusing, but just pause and look at your variable table. I is holding the value zero. J is holding the value zero. I'm just asking for, hey, what's in the top left corner here? What's, what's the value that's in the top left corner? And in this particular case, it's gonna be a three. So the first time through the loop, it'll add a three to sum. Then, because we, we put a three in nums of zero, zero. Then look at the cool thing that happens. The inner loop is gonna continue to run. We finished the body of the inner loop, so we're going to update the inner loop J plus plus equals one. And then we test J again, we're like, hey, is J less than nums of zero dot length? And how would I translate this into a sentence we might understand? I'm asking, have we finished the column yet? We're in the first row and we're going number by number down that row. Have we reached the number that's in the last column yet? And J is just one. These rows are four columns long. So we pass again and we're good to go. So now when we get inside the inner for loop again, the J loop, it's gonna to ask to add, all right, what's nums of zero, one, and add that number to sum. Now in this particular case, because I've only put three values in, nums of zero, one, there's nothing there. But what's cool is this cycle of updating J to check the next number in the row is gonna continue. It's gonna say, all right, uh, add nums of zero, zero, then add nums of zero, one, then add nums of zero, two, nums of zero, three, and then when J hits the value of four, four is not less than four and it's gonna go ahead and stop. So it, J does hold the value of four up, but for a brief moment and then it stops. Then this is the magic. This is what makes nested for loops traversing the whole array work. When the J loop finishes, the J loop is the body of the I loop and the I loop gets to update itself. And now I, which was zero becomes one. And we're tested, hey, I, are you still less than nums.length? Is one less than three? So if the test of the inner loop was, have you finished all the columns? Have you made it down to the end of the row? The test of the outer loop is trying to ask the question, hey, have you visited the last row yet? So it's an important thing that the outer loop helps visit each row. The inner loop helps visit each element in each row. That's kind of the difference here. Because uh, the value of i is gonna pass, one is less than three. So we re-enter the body of the outer loop, the, the i loop, the, we're entering the body of the i loop, which is the j loop, and the j loop gets to start fresh. The j loop is re-initialized, thank you, Mouse. The j loop is re-initialized to zero, and we go again. But now, instead of testing the values 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, now we're gonna test 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, and then eventually that four is gonna end again. The J loop will finish. The I loop gets to update. I becomes two, I is tested. I passes because two is the index of the last row. Remember we said there's three rows. So two is the index of the last row. And we're gonna test all of the elements in that row as well. Zero, one, two, three, four. And remember, I'm only putting the four down, not because we're gonna test the value at zero, four, just because it's important to recognize that for a brief moment, J will hold that value and test it, and then it will fail, and that's how we exit the for loop. Just like for a brief moment, I will hold the value three and test it, and it will fail. So what we're seeing here is when i is values 0, 1, and 2, and when j is values 0, 1, 2, 3, then we enter this innermost for loop to access this statement to access a particular element in the two-dimensional array to use it. Whenever you see, if you're looking at some code that's asking you a question and you see nums of i, j, or what some people will do is they'll use r, and C, maybe they had, instead of I, they're using R, 
instead of J, they're using C to represent row and column. That's another popular way to do it. Uh, if you see that, you're looking at a array traversal. If it was IJ, it's a two-dimensional array traversal, most likely. If it's IJK, it's a three-dimensional array traversal. Because you guessed it, the way to traverse a three-dimensional array is to triple nest a for loop. The reason this technique works is because nesting for loops allows us to visit every combination of I and J that we need. You have to imagine this three by four, if I were to draw a picture of this thing, boy, this is gonna be tricky to see here. So there's the three rows. I'm gonna draw, or I'm gonna write down what the indexes are, not the element, I'm gonna write what the indexes are. This top left corner is zero, zero. Row zero, column zero. The next element is zero comma one. Then after that, it's zero comma two. And after that, it's zero comma three. These are the indexes of the first row. And you'll notice they match all of the values for i is zero here and j is zero, one, two, and three. I got i is always zero, the first number is always zero, and j is zero, one, two, three. In the next row, it's row is one, column is zero. Row is one, column is one. Row is one, column is two. Row is one, column is three. And in the last row, it's row is two, column is zero. Row is two, column is one. Row is two, column is two. And row is two, column is three. I feel like there's an uneven number of spaces. Ah, that's better, that's better. The nested, for loop allows me to hit each of these number combinations that I need so that I can actually access all the elements. This is how we traverse a multi-dimensional array. You might be thinking to yourself, gosh, that is incredibly tedious. Is there an easier way? Well, you might recall the for each loop is a special loop designed to work just with collections, just with groups of data like an array or what we're going to see later the array list, and there's a way to do an equivalent task right here. So let's let's print out sum just to make sure it gives us that value of 50 that we're looking for. And bam, there it is. It added up the three, the five, the 42, and nine other zeros in uh, these elements, and we got our 50. So we're good. Well, what if we instead wanted to use a for each loop? Let me show what that's going to look like. I'm going to move my variable table. Oh no. I should have just moved the print statement. There we go. So here's what you would do if you want to use a for each loop. And remember, the rules of the for each loop are you can only use a for each loop if you intend to retrieve information from your array. You're not meant to change the contents of the array with a for each loop. If you want to do that, then you need to have access to an index, and you might as well just use a for loop anyway because the for loop's gonna have an i and a j, whereas the for each loop is not. So if you're just trying to read from this multi-dimensional array and you are comfortable visiting every element, you don't wanna skip elements, you don't wanna go every other element, you don't wanna skip particular rows, if you're comfortable visi visiting every element, this technique's gonna work. So how do we accomplish this task with a for each loop? I'm gonna say for, and then remember the format for this is I say a type, and I identify the type of element that I'm gonna pull out of this thing, and then I say where I get it from. Well, remember the outer loop's job is to visit each row. So the element that I'm gonna pull out here is gonna be a row of values, and a row is a one-dimensional array. Okay, typing is good, there we go. So I'm gonna call this row. And where am I pulling rows from? I'm pulling it from nubs. So right now, every time this for loop runs, it's gonna pull out a single row. And that row, in the case of nubs, has got four values in it, right? There's four columns in our little three by four rectangle. So now I gotta break down every row. Just like the J loop helped to break down every row, I need an, an internal for each loop to break down every row right here. So I'm gonna say for int, uh, I'll call it n, for int n in row, 
and bam. Now look at how much cleaner that looks. I'm not getting stressed about uh, nums.length or nums of zero.length. I'm not having to manage which one's the I variable, which one's the J variable. I'm not worried about if I accidentally switched them and then I've got a whole nother nightmare of a problem. I can just say sum plus equals uh, N and I'm done. These are equivalent. These currently do the exact same thing. And before you get all excited to use the for each loop every time, remember, it has got restrictions. You're not changing anything in the multidimensional array, and you are not uh, skipping anything. You are committed to visiting all the elements in order, from row zero to the final row, from column zero to the final column. So this is a really valuable way to do it. Um, and this leads me to the last thing I want to talk about which is there can be in multidimensional arrays, sometimes you want different number of elements in each row. And this is called a jagged array. The truth is, uh, in my experience, they're not as common. I don't think they're as common on the AP test, um, though I think there have been jagged array questions on the AP test before, and we can talk about that later. Um, I also don't hear about them being used in industry as often as regular one-dimensional arrays or rectangular two-dimensional arrays. A jagged array is where I say, all right, give me a two-dimensional array. I'm going to call it jagged, uh, but you could, I mean, this again, this is an identifier. It could be anything. But I'm going to say, hmm, you know, I know the number of rows I want. I want there to be two rows, but I am not sure how many columns I want to have. And the crazy thing we can do right here is I can say, all right, you know what? First row, jagged of zero. Remember that represents first row. Let's give that thing mm, four elements and then jagged of one, which is the next and in this case, last row. Let's give that thing seven elements. And if you can believe it, this compiles. I'll show you what it looks like. Let's go ahead and comment out this. I'm going to use that arrays.deep2 string trick. Let's see here. Arrays.deep2 string. Boop. Remember, you have to, if you do this, you have to import arrays. I think I forgot to mention that in the last video. I'm going to go and print out jagged. And you know what? I might shrink these numbers down just to make it a little bit clearer what's going on. I'll make this. Uh, the first row will have two elements, and the second row will have three. I go to print this out, and bam, there it is. It's not rectangular. There are two elements in the first row and three elements in the bottom. If I was to recreate this indexes chart like I did for the three by four above, you'd be looking at the first element is at zero, zero. The next one is at row zero, column one. Then in the next row, you've got row one, column zero, row one, column one, and row one, column two. And this is where it gets its name jagged. If you were to visualize this, the different lengths of rows don't make this look this two-dimensional array look like a nice, clean, geometric uh, rectangle. It's got a jagged edge, right? It's got these sharp spikes. I could easily have had five rows. One of them could be a length of 17. The other could be a length of one. That's all totally okay. Um, there are reasons why you would want to create a multidimensional array where there are you know, a different number of values in each row. And it might have something to do with the kind of information you're collecting. You know there's only, maybe there's seven rows, one representing each day of the week. And you know there's only two data values on the Monday, but there's five data values on the Tuesday, something like that. This presents a unique problem for traversal. And I'm going to copy and paste my nested for loops up here and see if you can spot the reason why the usual code doesn't work there. If I change this to jagged and jagged, can you spot... What's going on in here that is not going to meet the needs of this jagged array? You can pause for a second if you want to. 
I'm going to tell you right here, it's this. It's this jagged of zero. Jagged of zero is going to assume that the length of the first row is the same as the length of this, the second row. And we can see in the case of the jagged array, that's not true. So what's going to happen is it's going to assume if the code as written, as you see in front of you right now, is going to assume that the next row is the same length of the first row. And when it goes to do its little summing technique, it's going to miss this last element right here. It'll find 0, 0, and 0, 1. It'll find 1, 0, and 1, 1. But it will ask the question, is j less than the length of the first row? And by the time j reaches the value 2, which we need it to, we need j to get to the value of 2 to see the end of this thing right here. It's going to say, nope, 2 is not less than 2, and we fail. So to fix our for loop traversal code so that we can handle jagged arrays, we change this to an i. Why did I change that to an i? Because now instead of asking every row if it is as long as the first row, I ask each row if it's as long as that row is. So when I'm in i of 0, I'm going to say, all right, jagged of 0 dot length. How long is this first row? But when I'm in row 1 and i is 1, so remember index 1 means it's the second row, then I'm going to check if jagged of 1 dot length, if we've reached that number yet. So this is a little tip to make sure that you uh, are, when you're doing your multi-dimensional array traversal with nested for loops, make sure your outer loop goes to name of array dot length and make sure your inner loop goes to name of array of i dot length. That'll make sure just in case the array you're traversing is jagged, it makes sure that you get everything. What's really, really cool about the for each loop is that when we pull out each row and we ask our inner for loop to visit each element in each row, it takes care of the jaggedness for us. It knows the nature of the for each loop is it's like, yep, I go from the first element to the last element. It's doing all the worrying about length and index for us. So for that reason, as long as you're comfortable visiting all the elements and not making any changes, for each loops are often a really slick way to traverse jagged arrays. Okay. That was a big one. Thanks for watching.